Yeah, so if you want to be a successful social media ghostwriter, the first thing I advise people to do is, is grow your own social media first. And I was sitting there in the snow and uh, I'm freezing my ass off. I'm like, I'm making all this money, but I'm just absolutely miserable and I'm young. And I'm just thinking like, is this what I want for my life? Dude, if you're not cringing at your past self or you're not realizing how dumb you were or whatever, I mean, it shows that you're not really evolving. The biggest thing with, with most people, why they don't succeed is mindset. They just don't believe in themselves. They don't apply what, what they, they learn because they're procrastinating or they don't think they can do it or whatever. Podcast The Best, czyli Daniel Bawi, edukuje, słucha i tłumaczy. Podcast dla copywriterów, którzy chcą zarabiać więcej hajsu. Siema, dzisiaj z nami specjalny gość. Ten facet to ojciec chrzestny tego podcastu. Kiedy zastanawiałem się, czy założyć podcast, dostałem od niego newsletter, w którym pisał Jestem wścieku, wścieku treści. I że trzeba być w tym wścieku, by zobaczyć, jak wygląda gówno, żeby gówno unikać. Po tym mailu powiedziałem sobie, jebać, zaczynam. I odpisałem mu. I ku mojemu zaskoczeniu odpisał, że jak będę miał 20 odcinków, to przyjdzie do mnie do podcastu. I dzisiaj jest. As you can see, I switched to English, which means our today's guest is not Polish. He's a man without whom this podcast would have been delayed or even non-existent. A man who's making his ends meet, writing a tweet from anywhere in his underwear, not giving a shit. 500,000 souls following him on social media, a man who has wrongs to write, Dakota Robertson. Hi there. Dude, that, that was <laughs> to make ends meet, he likes to tweet <laughs> and it, from anywhere in his underwear. I like that. I want to steal that. Uh, thank you for coming in. Uh, I believe your time is precious. So let's get, let's cut to the chase. What was the most recent thing you wrote for money? Most recent thing I wrote for money. Uh, well, I launched my, my cohort where I train people on how to become ghostwriters. So I guess the emails I wrote for that, promoting that a week ago, I guess. Yeah, that, that was. Okay, got it. So you're still writing yourself, your content. I, I read you hired someone and paid him like crazy amounts of money and dumped him eventually. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, so I write all my content, but when I was scaling my coaching program, I had a friend who was helping me, he was hopping on calls with me every week and he's doing it for free. And I, I, I did ayahuasca. And when I was on ayahuasca, I was thinking, oh, like he's a really good friend. I should, you know, pay him because he had an offer where he helped people do it. And it was $25,000. And I was like, oh, I should, you know, I should, I should just pay for it. So I did. And I didn't realize how incompetent he was at what he actually did because I was getting him part of his offer was trying to help me write emails or he's going to write emails for me and promote my stuff and all that. It's like, okay, I don't, I don't like the thought of someone writing for me, but I was like, all right, let's do it. I trust you. And the emails were so bad. They were written terribly. And the guy was just wildly incompetent. So it's funny because it was the most amount of money I invested in a mentor, but he was the worst one I ever invested in. <laughs> so price does not always equal quality. So after that, I was like, I'm never having someone write for me again. So nice. I learned the hard way that uh, you do not <laughs> hey. you do not yeah. hire people you know you do not hire colleagues you do not hire friends because they they tend to tra take you for granted and they, they tend to slack because you know it's it's a friend he's not gonna like punish me for that or hire well, I, don't, I, I think i don't even think it was that i think it was just he just he's just wildly incompetent <laughs> i think he would have done it for anybody i was, I was a fucking amazed how bad he was um but yeah like I've had, I've had experiences where I've hired people I've known and it worked really well. Um, but just that case, it was, it was more of me playing on emotion or trusting my emotion more than my logic. And that was a good lesson to learn is you, you shouldn't be emotional in business. You shouldn't do things because you're just friends. You should do it because it makes sense and it's logical. 
True, true. So what's, what was logical for you was ghostwriting on Twitter. How did you end up in there? Uh, one more question before we proceed. Do we call it Twitter or do we call it X or do we call it X call Twitter, Twitter or? Let's call it Twitter. Uh, we're, we're diehards. Back in my day, it was called <laughs> Twitter. Uh, so I got into ghostwriting. Well, originally I was in crypto in 2018 and I was investing in crypto. So I was staying up to date with the news on Twitter and I stumbled across a course promoting how to grow on Twitter. And, and at that point, I tried different stuff in the past that with business and and stuff like that, like eBay flipping, Amazon FBA, iPhone flipping, all that stuff. And I just thought, oh, that looks interesting. So took the course, started learning Twitter, got involved in the scene where uh, there's a section of Twitter called Money Twitter with all the young entrepreneurs just talking about business and, and philosophy or whatever. So I got kind of indoctrinated in that scene and eventually got exposed to one, one guy, JK Molina, who was talking about how he was getting paid to write tweets for a living. He's kind of posting about it. And that, that really got me interested. And yeah, I mean, I hired my mentor, Dan Co to kind of help me set up that offer. And, um november of 2021 was when i launched my ghostwriting business and started landing clients pretty quick after launching my website so i was like oh there's big demand for this and eventually uh scaled up um you make a living ghostwriting on in social media so how does one become a successful ghostwriter what what do you need what traits do you need to make a living out of it yeah, so if you want to be a successful social media ghostwriter, the first thing I advise people to do is is grow your own social media first. Because if you don't know how to grow your own social media, you're not going to be able to grow other people's social media. And it's just going to be stressful. <laughs> so I always tell people to grow their own social media first. And there's different ways to do it. But I, the way I found that works the best from training people and doing it myself is pick a skill that you have interest in and that other people have interest in and help people solve their problems. So for me, I chose writing and I help people get better at writing so they can make more money, so they could you know, improve their persuasiveness, communication. And I would just give writing tips and I, I would teach what I was learning to people that were a few steps behind me. And that allowed me to grow my social media and grow following. And once I kind of understood the nuance of it, I offered it as a service to other people. Okay. Do you think it's possible for a, a person from Poland to, to be a successful ghostwriter writing in English? Yeah, hundred percent. Like you have to, you have to be a good listener when you interview your ghostwriting clients because that's part of it you know interviewing your ghostwriting clients because you when you hop on a call with them and you ask them interesting questions they're going to tell you interesting answers and they're doing pretty much all the writing for you because you just take that call after and you transcribe it using an app like otter ai and then boom you have all the writing there you just gotta sort it in a way that is appealing on social media or maybe you got to trim it trim the fluff a little bit but yeah it's uh it's a lot more simple than people think uh but just there's just so many different pieces that people overcomplicate it but yeah i think i think it's definitely doable and then especially with a program like grammarly or pro writing aid or hemingway app they can really help you catch mistakes and tonality errors with your writing i might do it one day but uh, i think it's our national trait that people are afraid to speak or even write english because uh, my my english teacher ian gallagher said that us slavs uh, people from uh, middle and eastern europe we have huge problems talking in english uh, abroad 
and uh, people from Spain or Italy, they don't give a shit. They just, they, they speak really, really crude English and they don't give a fuck. So, and people understand them. So I think it's our national trait. And perhaps people don't believe in Twitter in Poland that much because uh, everything that, that's happening on Twitter in Poland, uh, it revolves around politics and sports. And that's basically it. Maybe, maybe some business thing, things, but I think we might not be there yet. And people translate Polish Twitter to um, American uh, Twitter and, and they don't, they don't believe it's possible. Yeah, it's, it's funny how there's these different pockets of the internet. And if you're in a different country or continent, those pockets change. But yeah, I find Twitter's probably one of the least popular social media apps, but it, for me, it's been the most useful. I, I just find when there's, when there's written text opposed to quick dopamine videos, it attracts smarter people from my experience. We'll see about that because maybe, maybe someone from my country will be interested in going in there and uh, actually making something out of it instead of just whining that it's impossible and it can't be done. And since we're at the topic of can't be done and beliefs, you wouldn't be here if not for your resilience. You had the tough childhood that you're pretty open about, and yet it didn't stop you. Uh, I remember Brian Tracy in Psychological, Psychology of Selling said that both people from, um, from poor houses uh, and uh, good houses can become rich. And the difference is the mindset. So how did you overcome your start? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't. I wonder about this too. I don't, I can't point it to one thing or even, I'm not even sure you know exactly why but i feel like sports played a big role i trained jujitsu for many years as a kid and I, I think that humbled me a lot reading i read a lot as a kid i think that improved my my mindset on stuff or my creativity uh, but i also think genetics too i think i just i might have lucked out with genetics and it just formed you know, my mind in a certain way to adapt to different situations. Um, I also had a very loving mother who was very affectionate toward me and she cared about me a lot. So I think it's a combination of things. And I, I, I can't, I don't think it was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm just hardcore and, you know, I made my, my mindset. But yeah, it's, I don't know. I'm not exactly sure, but I, I think it, the big contributors would be sports, reading, my mom, and yeah, just genetics. That's interesting what you're saying. You said that you trained jujitsu and it humbled you. And I also had tough childhood, which is uh, probably why I in the, identify with you so much. And uh, I also got humbled because when I was 18, I finished writing my novel and it was a piece of shit like literally it was when i come back to come back to it to read it like like how could i be so stupid like come on <laughs> and i wanted to publish it online uh, and people people said that it's trash people said it's like really awful like it shouldn't see the the light of the day and i had the choice i had the choice to say that other people might be right or i had a choice to say they are not right I am right. And I chose the, the first option uh, to humble myself and and state that some some other people might be right. And I think it 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 might be might have been the the cornerstone of of the success. Just yeah. Like, and well like dude, if you're not cringing at your past self or you're not realizing how dumb you were or whatever, I mean it shows that you're not really evolving. So the fact that you can look back and be like, oh, that was a piece of shit shows that your standards and your ability is that much higher now. So really, it's a good thing. <laughs> I cringe at so much stuff I create. And then I'm like, oh, well, it's good that I realize that now. And I'm not just continuing to create that kind of stuff. And then I'm sure 
you know, next month or next year, I'll, I'll think the same thing of where I'm at now. So it's a, it's a funny, bittersweet process. Yes. And, and it shows progress because you look back at what you did and, and you see what you're doing now and, and you're like, Hmm, I'm getting good at it. Uh, and most people, I, I think that most people wouldn't even start because they're so afraid of, of doing something wrong because the people will be laughing at them and, uh, and so on, or maybe they tried and, uh, and failed. Uh, mm -hmm. And as I believe it was Confucius who said that a man of success is not the one who never fails, is the one who um, who wasn't stopped by his failure. So that's inspiring. Yeah. Speaking of inspiration, you said that uh, you met your mentor, Dan Cole, and you moved in with him. And I believe it was Taylor Welch who said that a weak person surrounded by strong people will uh, have a success and a uh, strong, pe strong person surrounded by weak people will fail, which was which we could see in NBA uh, with Cleveland Cavaliers, with LeBron James or the, I believe, 2007-8 Lakers with Kobe Bryant, where it was just Kobe and a bunch of role players. And um, it's tough. It's tough to to have a poor team and you moved in with him you lived with him and um the other guy who was the third one Remind me. Devin. Devin yeah Devin, and Devin. um tell us why it was important for you and how it becomes so important yeah so it's funny actually um so i'm in arizona now when i moved in with dan we went to texas um, <clears throat> but Dan actually just moved into the same apartment building as me and my buddy, Nick, I'm living with my other buddy now. Um, but yeah, like, man, if you're in entrepreneurship or really any ambitious field, it, it's important to surround yourself around other ambitious people. And that's my thought, especially if you're a man, just, just, I think the, it's important to have men around you that are ambitious it's like the it's like steel sharpened steel or whatever the, the fucking saying is um because one thing that was interesting living with dan and my buddy jk also moved in for a month but we would one of us would go to the coffee shop and we'd be there for a few hours and then it would motivate the other one to go to the coffee shop or one person would start working and motivate the other person to start working or i'd see dan go to the gym and it would motivate me to go to the gym so it was just this flywheel where we were all improving our lives and it was encouraging the other person to do the same as well. So it's good to have that energy around and especially with entrepreneurship because it can be lonely because you're the black sheep of society. So if you're trying something new or different, a lot of your friends and family, they won't understand and they'll tell you, oh, wait, why are you doing that? Or maybe you should go back to college or, you know, that's not safe or whatever. But you got to surround yourself around people that don't think you're crazy. They think, oh, yeah, yeah, let's do it. You know, they're, they're not viewing your way of life as something that's out of this world. So when you surround yourself around people like that, it has a compounding effect where you can share ideas, your energies, um, share your failures and and. and when you have that, you're just encouraged that much more. And it, it just feels like you're going on a journey together and it's a lot more encouraging. So yeah, that's why I mean, for the past two, two and a half years now, I've been doing that. I mean, I'm living with my buddy Nick right now in Arizona until the end of March or until March 2nd. Then I go back to Canada for like a month, but um, yeah, it's just, it's good to surround yourself around people like that. I think especially when you're young and, and a man in your twenties, I think it really, it's really beneficial. Yeah. I, I believe it was uh, some smart person who said that you're the average of five people that you spend the most time with. So yeah. What do you want to be? Okay. Let's, let's just move on. So um, the next yeah. question is you, you said you're living in Arizona right now. You mentioned mm -hmm. ayahuasca. Uh, I remember you were in Dubai. You you, op you often say that you were 
making lots of money in Dubai, right? In tweets in the in the in your underwear. So uh, yeah. and you also have been in, in Thailand and the concept of of being of not being bound by borders and orders, it's also inspiring and made me realize I also crave it. I also want freedom. It's it's not the money I want, it's what I want, it's what I can do with the money. And with money, uh, Chris Rock said that wealth is not having a lot of money, wealth is having a lot of options. So how do you come to realize that it's the freedom that you desire the most? Yeah, when I was 19, I I was working a, a job I hated. I was an electrician and I was working on gas plants 12 to 14 hours a day, surrounded by people that were miserable. I was the youngest one on the construction site, so I got a lot of flack. And I just, I was listening to podcasts and one of the podcast hosts mentioned how he went to Vietnam or Thailand or something. That it was one of the best experiences of his life. And I was sitting there in the snow and I, I'm freezing my ass off. I'm like, I'm making all this money, but I'm just absolutely miserable and I'm young. And I'm just thinking like, is this what I want for my life? So it just gave me the idea to book a plane ticket somewhere and just go backpack. So I, I did that. I booked a plane ticket to Thailand and yeah, months later went. And while I was there, I, I experienced a level of freedom and independence I never experienced before. And it was it was really freeing and it was cool because I I, I wasn't working. I, I didn't have anything to do but travel. And it was one of the most best experiences of my life because it was like living out of it, it was like I was living in a movie for three months. It was amazing. The craziest stories happened to me. And um, it was really wholesome because I met so many amazing people and I had so many great stories with them. And I just felt really connected to humanity. And it just made me realize, wow, I want, if I, I want the option to do this whenever. I want to be able to go travel. I want to be able to see these different sites and I want to meet different people. And I just want to go live, right? Something I think about a lot is death and getting to the end of my my life and looking back on my life. And I'm scared to look back on it with regret and knowing I left not reaching my potential, not living the life I wanted, not having cool stories. And that scares the shit out of me. And it's a big motivator for me, for my life. So, yeah, it's... Um, it was cool. That trip really opened my eyes and made me realize I have to find a way to make money online so I can do this if I want, you know, on a random Tuesday. I think a lot of people share the same dream, but uh, I, I remember now what I was supposed to say that uh, might be another national trait of all people that we are naysayers. We are like, we're the best at it. I'm not afraid to say it. We're the best. I like, why are you doing this? Do not do it. It's it makes no sense. You're just gonna fail. Like, stay stay at home. Just why why can't you find a normal job? Like, what is wrong with you? Uh, and a lot of people will not do it uh, and possibly waste their lives. Like, I think I I remember you once you wrote that the typical scheme for people is to go to college. Uh, finish, graduate, find a job, work 35, 35 years, and enjoy your retirement. <laughs> you can say that. <laughs> like, what to enjoy when you're 65? Uh, everything, everything hurts, and you hate your life. So, I totally get it. Yeah, yeah. Fuck that. <laughs> I wanna like. It's like, yeah. What are you gonna do? work in an office? I mean, there's, I, I'm not gonna knock it if you enjoy that. But for me, it's just the thought of working in an office or working on a construction site for 40 years and like hoping to get time off and, you know, being for me, I feel like a slave to somebody else and just absolutely hating my life. That's just not for me. I'm not going to do that. So I'd rather, you know, go take a risk with entrepreneurship and look like an idiot for a few years while I figured it out than spend 40 years at a, at a safe job and, go that route yeah. but once you said um, said wrote uh, in the newsletter that uh, you had a job uh, that was 
unengaging, so to speak, because you were working on uh, on uh, oil platforms as uh, yeah, gas plants, yeah, uh, gas plants, and uh, and it wasn't like the most engaging job. Like you, you need to um, be there eight hours straight because uh, there was not a lot of job, a lot of work to do, and also you worked as a um, security guard or some, some yep. stuff like this. And I think it's great. I mean, except for the fact that you are freezing your ass off, like I, I all often see people sitting in their offices. Like there, there's a girl uh, selling liquids for the e-pens, uh, for the e-cigarettes. And she's doing nothing. And I'm thinking like I was working in, a, in an insurance company and I also had downtimes during my office hours. And I was so stupid to watch uh, replays of League of Legends. Like, <laughs> I could have been learning. I could have been learning how to write. I could have been building my brand. I could have been preparing for leaving the job that I was also feeling like uh, like a slave. So, uh, could you tell us something about the side hustle that became the main job? What was the story? Yeah. So I. Well, when I took that Twitter course, I was working at Domino's Pizza at the time as a delivery driver, and I was in college. Three months after taking that course, I dropped out, and I quit my job to go all in. Um, months later, I was like, okay, I got to like make some money. Sorry, I got the sunshine. I mean, I'm super bright. Um, and I took a job as a security guard up at a, at a camp, um, like a, a worker camp because they would house the construction workers, um, at a camp, whatever. And I was a security guard there. And my idea was like, I'm going to work as a security guard and then because I work night shift. And then when there was downtime, I was just going to write tweets. I was going to read books, all that. And essentially I'd just get paid to learn. And I did that as a security guard for like two weeks before I got laid off because there's COVID stuff happening. Um, <laughs> uh, but I did that again, like two years before that, or a year before that as a medic as well. And that time I was trying to learn day trading, but I was also reading business books and all that stuff. So that was kind of a, a tactic I, I learned with these jobs. It's like find jobs that you have downtime or you can have a AirPod in your ear and just listen to audiobooks and educate yourself. Like I did that with Domino's pizza as well. I think that's why I chose it because I could listen, I could do deliveries, listening to audiobooks um, and courses while I was doing that. You said learning. You said learning a lot, reading a lot, listening to audiobooks or podcasts. Uh, I feel like some people, especially the people who are yet, let's say, who are yet to reach success or may never reach success, they don't want to learn. And also, for aforementioned Brian Tracy said that if you want to earn more, you need to learn more. So you spent over a million dollars on education. No, Why? no, I have no, no, not a million, <laughs> like 200,000. <000. laughs> yeah, okay. uh, not a million. Yeah. <laughs> it will be in like probably five years or something, but yeah. You know why? Because $200,000 uh, uh, $200, is a million in our currency. So that's, that's, ah, what, gotcha, that's gotcha. <laughs> uh, There you go. Good. Um, yeah. The reason why is because like if I went up, and if I went up to you and if I said, if I could, down, if I can upload all the skills to your brain to make a million dollars or make a hundred thousand dollars, and all you had to do was pay me you know, five thousand dollars, would you do it? That's, like, that's a no-brainer. Like, shut up yeah. and take my money. Exactly. Well, we don't have that technology yet, so. The next closest thing you can do is pay someone that's in a position that you want to be in and do what they tell you because they've already done what, what you want to do. So 
it's like the fastest path. It's like, sure, you can figure it out all on your own by applying for years, like doing shit for years, or you could like go read books and that'll speed it up. Or you just like pay a mentor who's read the books, who's done the experience, who knows the nuances and can tell you all the mistakes and tell you what to do. And then you're like, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And just do it. And then you get results and then you make more money and you're like, oh, cool. That worked. Let me pay someone else to help me with this other problem I'm having. And it's the same process. And sure, sometimes you might get screwed over like I did with my friend. Um, but uh, I mean, it's the name of the game. But yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's been one of the most useful investments I've invested. Well, it is the most useful investment, like knowledge. Because like you can, I could lose everything today, but I could build it back because now I, I know what to do. I have the knowledge in my brain of how to build back and that's something nobody can take away from me unless they chop my head off which i hope they know i mean like ch chopping off your head will not take your i mean it will take your knowledge away from you because you'll be dead yeah. but they're not gonna take it for themselves like yeah know, like exactly said, the technology is not there yet but uh I'm, i feel you i feel you because i paid uh, five thousand in our currency for uh, a mentorship and brother that's like that's a no brainer. Like having someone who's been there, done that, to ask you a dumb question, like, what would you do with that? And get an answer instantly. Like it's worth almost every kind of money and people uh, don't want to do it. They, they don't want to pay someone for telling them sometimes obvious stuff <laughs> because yeah. then they, won't, they don't want to pay at all. Like the knowledge is for free in the internet. Okay, be my guest, go search for it. Tell me how it go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it's it's funny. It's like a lot of it stuff you already know. You should be doing, but you're not doing it. It's not until you pay a big, hefty price. It's like oh, okay, I'll do it now. Like that's a for me. Like I've been training and exercising for thirteen years, lifting weights. And last year, I was just slacking on my on my weightlifting and training. So I paid a coach like four thousand or five thousand dollars just to hold me accountable i'm like i just want i know what to do just just check in on me every week I'm like he's like okay yeah uh, that that's another thing you, you wrote once that you bought a pen for uh, 870 bucks i believe correct me yeah. if I'm wrong. Uh, and yeah. that the psychological whip on you because i paid for it i gotta use it i gotta do something with it and and, yeah. uh, and the trainer and I, I had the same with this mentorship it's not only that i paid for it and i gotta make use of it uh it's uh, also the thing that uh, if i don't make use of it my fiance will chop my head off like <laughs> that she's she's she would not let me leave she's gonna be constantly nagging that why did you pay so much and you're not making money out of it like you dumb shit. so <laughs> I, get, I get it i get it <laughs> yeah and you said that the best, one of the best ways to learn something yourself is to learn yourself first and then start teaching others. And you are teaching others. Uh, as you mentioned, you have uh, a cohort. Uh, you closed it right now, I guess. Yeah. So what is this cohort about? Uh, are you going to be opening it uh, in the future? Like, maybe. A link yeah. going to be in the description. Or yes, the co wait list. The cohort is well, basically shows people how to grow and monetize their social media. Um, and I'm showing them how to ghostwrite. So if they want to ghostwrite newsletters or they want to ghostwrite social media accounts, they can do that. Um, but yeah, essentially, it's how to grow your personal brand, how to monetize it. And I probably will be opening it like five, six months, maybe. Um, I'm just restructuring some stuff and you're gonna throw in a different offer um, in, in like the next two months, probably. So yeah, I, I'll probably open the cohort in five months, maybe, but it'll, it'll be different. I think I'll be less hands-on. I think I'll, I'll delegate a bit more and just remove myself a little bit. I'll still be 
I'll still be very hands on, but like not as much as I am in this one. This one's like very, very hands on. So, um, yeah, just trying to find ways to, to not have me juggling so many things. Um, so yeah, it'll be, I'll probably release it again in the future, but it'll be different. <laughs> what does it teach people? What this, what does this cohort teach people? You said building brand and yeah, it teaches writing, teaches storytelling, it teaches marketing, it teaches web design, it teaches sales, it teaches uh, what else? Uh, systems, processes, content frameworks, like literally fucking everything they need. Um, but m I put more of an emphasis on the writing and content side and personal branding um, and some of the the business side but yeah it really shows them everything they need okay you said that even if people from poland can succeed and show me the money as jerry mcguire said show me the money <laughs> i've seen people doing some crazy results like landing 2.5k buy-in within the first month and then uh, 10 and 20 and more thousand dollars a month regularly so mm -hmm. could you share some some results from your people yeah so anthony carlton he did like ninety one thousand dollars in a month last month uh so he scaled up to that in a year Talon simmons he scaled up to 70k a month clifton sellers scaled up to eighty thousand dollars a month um fernando chow zhao uh, scaled to 30k a month um like there's a lot of people that, that scaled up anywhere between 10 to 91 K a month. Um, there's also a lot of people that, you know, they, they didn't make any money at all because they just didn't apply or they weren't consistent. Um, and they just didn't ask questions or like really like the biggest thing with, with most people, why they don't succeed as mindset. They just don't believe in themselves. They don't apply what they they learn because they're procrastinating or they don't think they can do it or whatever and it's just like that's a big part of my job is like helping people overcome limiting beliefs because think about people that have never done have never created content or have never started a business they just have so many beliefs instilled from them in them from society or school or family friends and they're trying to overcome that and they don't even, they barely have belief that they can do it. And then they have friends and family telling them they can't do it. And it can be a lot and it really gets in people's heads and it prevents them from getting results. So yeah, there's like a lot of people that have gotten success from the program. There's still people that, you know, they, they didn't get success from the program and I did everything. Like I tried to, to help a lot of them, but a lot of them like, a lot of people just got shit to sort out and it's, it's just the name of the game. And I think a lot of people will paint, Oh, it's all sunshine and rainbows. And you know, you'll make 10 K by tomorrow. But a lot of that's just bullshit. Like I try to temper expectations with people like, look, this is a long-term thing. You have to stick with this long-term and you have to be consistent with it. And if you're just in this to make a quick buck, this program isn't for you. Like go join some other fucking scammy dude. That's going to tell you, Oh yeah, you'll be 10 K by next week. So it's just really important to go in with the right mindset. Yes, this is like, I can make a lot of money with this, but yes, I'm going to have to apply what I'm learning and I'm going to have to be consistent with it. And then I'm, it might take three months. It might take six. It might take 12 months. Like I've had people scale up to what well, Talon hit like 20 K a month within a month or something. And my, another guy did that, but that's not the normal. Like a lot of people, to see what oh he's like ninety one thousand dollars a month within a year i'm totally gonna do this i never i didn't even hit that like there's just people that are just uh, might be lucky or they have the right skill set or mindset or, or whatever um but there's so many variables and i think a lot of people to say yeah you're gonna make a million dollars a year if you join my program it's like no you're not <laughs> probably not <laughs> not in like pretty not maybe like in a few years but i wouldn't say like right away but yeah
Uh, that's funny. I think it's a common thing that uh, for for our, both our countries that uh, I, I think people from uh, from Poland are buying um, trainings from uh, from these guys uh, and they're trying to apply this here and and they're also saying that buy my program and you're gonna hit whatever the number you want in instantly, almost instantly. Just just buy it. Just buy it. You don't need anything else. Just buy. It. I like what you're saying that not everyone succeeds because not everyone works on themselves and not everyone applies the knowledge i like it because too many times i see people showing just you know like showing the people with the results with crazy results not showing the people that don't have results like pretending they're non-existent pretending that i don't know thousand people signed uh, applied to your cohort and everybody succeeded and they're millionaires right away and uh, uh, you know hiding the truth uh, i like the the transparency so much much respect the next question is what was the toughest copy in your career to write the toughest the hardest one the the one that you spent the most time with that you will remember forever or something was Just like any... writing in general the, the toughest one, the, the one that you yeah. used the most brain at, or you wasted the most brain yeah. at? Um, well, there's two that come to mind. I mean, I, I wrote I wrote about the last time I saw my mom. And that was a post that I spent a lot of time on because it, it felt like I was honoring her in a way, just like telling that story that was a very meaningful story for me to tell and i just wrote i wrote about how um yeah i just talked about the last time i saw my mom uh and I, I spent a lot of time on that and yeah i was, I was very proud how that turned out because I, I think it really articulated my emotions and and how it felt and i know it it impacted a lot of people and i think it made them appreciate their mother and and their family a bit more and i was, I was proud of that um, so that, that, that was a piece I wrote. And then another one, I did my life story for YouTube. One of the first videos that took me so long to write. Oh my God. Um, that was like just tearing my hair out by the end of it. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was a long piece of writing. Um, so I, I, I think those two, but I think the most meaningful was, was the yeah, last time I saw my mom, uh, cause that was an impactful moment for me in my life. And I think I told the story well. Uh, I can tell that you told the story well because I remember that newsletter. So and it was uh, it was a piece to remember. I remember it. Oof. Uh, this kind of answer appears the first time in this podcast because usually the people are thinking about the, the toughest freaking article or email they they had to wrote like on the rocket science, not knowing anything about rocket science. And you're the first person talking about emotions and the emotional toll it took on you. So you're the first. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's something a lot of people shy away from is the emotional stuff. And I think it's important to talk about it because I, it's something a lot of people feel, but few people want to talk about. And yeah, I think it's important. Well, actually, a trivia uh one person applying for a job applying for a gig to me uh, i was supposed to pay her said that she doesn't want to work for me because of my backstory because because the story was um, also tough for me to write and and she said that she doesn't work uh, she doesn't want to work with a person that's opening himself about stuff like this like she doesn't care and and, and she won't work with me like i was like Go, I'm paying you here. So, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, and, that's but weird. Actually, I'm I'm glad she didn't work work with me because it shows that she has a different um, different values in her life. So we we were yeah. a match, probably. exactly. And as we're in the matching department, tell me about the worst client you ever had. <laughs> Uh, let me think. <laughs> There's one where he was just very picky 
on the content and we're we wrote so much for him but he was just telling us to change stuff and we're like the we know what works for social media and he's telling us to change stuff and he wanted to write about weird topics that didn't work well there's one point where there's like twenty four thousand dollars worth of outstanding invoices too and i wasn't sure if that was going to get paid and i was i was uh it's kind of stressing and he would just like never pay his invoices on time and it was just a shit show and it caused a lot of stress for my right hand guy joey because he was the one writing a lot of the content and i was just managing but yeah it was very stressful because there was just so it was it was all over the place but um yeah we we ended up firing that client <laughs> we just couldn't we just couldn't make it work yeah, I can tell. <laughs> I would be surprised if you had him uh, today. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely not. Um, that, that's the best question in the script because it shows uh, how much the worst clients teach us. It's not the best yeah. client that uh, that make us grow. It's it's the worst one. Like yeah, when you're saying that I'm not I'm not gonna make this mistake ever again, or I'm not gonna work with a person like this ever again, uh, and each. Uh, it gives us a lot of progress, I think. Yeah. Speaking of progress, what was the one thing that gave you the biggest leverage in your career? The the biggest jump in quality or earnings? Learning to write, because writing just seeped into every aspect of my life. Because when I actually dedicated more time to writing and learning it. I thought clearer, I was more articulate. I applied that to my social media and it compounded that growth. And it just allowed me to persuade better with the written word. And then it just made me more money. But like really like the biggest compounding effect has been social media. And that was the biggest influence on that was my writing because that opens up more doors to new people open up connections also makes people perceive me more as an authority he's like oh he's got whatever amount of followers uh so it made it easier to close deals and made it uh it made it easier to get more leads and just overall just just open up more opportunities in my life so it's been really cool um and that's like an asset that just continues to grow because the more followers you have, the more reach you tend to get. Um, so it's been, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been cool. Can you give us a one short tip for writing content on social media that you can tell us that's not in your cohort and it's not uh, secret knowledge? Pretty open with everything. Um, yeah, like the way I, I see social media, there's three buckets you want to hit, like with content and I call it the gap framework. So G is growth content. A is authority content. P is personal content. Growth content is anything, any topic or content that's top of mind for people. So this can be trending events, trending figures, uh, just trending anything. So like ChatGPT, Andrew Tate, Donald Trump, uh, stuff like that. You talk about that kind of content. And you don't have to talk about like that thing specifically, but you can like tie it back to your brand. So when ChatGPT was trending, you if I was a fitness coach, I could talk about how how to use ChatGPT to create a meal plan or to create a workout routine or break down Andrew Tate's workout routine when he was trending. Or I could break down Donald Trump's diet when he's well, he's always trending. <laughs> But uh, just tying those topics or those people back to my topic because that's going to generate interest because people have interest in those things and then they're going to see my content and then they might follow me. Then there's authority content. So that's solving people's pain points or helping them get to a desired outcome. And you can do that with like teaching a skill, giving knowledge, stuff like that. So if I'm a fitness coach, I talk about here's the best exercises for your chest. Here's how to lose fat. Here's how to do X, Y, Z. So creating content that that shows that or or shows my competence. 
So I could show a case study of how I helped Joe Blow lose 20 pounds in six months. I could show I helped Sarah Marshall, you know, put on five pounds of muscle in six months. Um, so anything that really positions you as an authority, that's authority content. And then there's personal content. So that's stuff that builds connection. So your stories, your worldviews, your opinions, uh, stuff like that, anything you share that really is unique to you, that will build a connection with your audience. So when you combine all three of these, the growth, authority, and personal content, it bridges the gap from a stranger to somebody that knows, likes, and trusts you. And when you have that, people will buy from you. Typically, if they if they need something, you're going to be the go-to person for that. So that's like one of the simplest ways I can break down social media. And I think a lot of people overcomplicate it. But if you're uh, you're hitting those three buckets of content, I think that's the best way to grow. Awesome, awesome. I gotta do some some of this, some of this Andrew Tate. I mean, not Andrew Tate because we don't have Andrew Tate here. But I'm mm. gonna, I'm gonna manage. Like we have some skilled dudes in in Poland. We'll see. We'll see. Um. Next question is one of the last questions. If you were to give one piece of advice to beginning ghostwriters or copywriters, what would that be? Read the book Writing Tools by Roy Peter Clark. That guy should really fucking sponsor me. I promote him so much. Um, I think it's an amazing book for copywriters and ghostwriters to read. It's my favorite writing book I've read. I think it just distinct. It simplifies stuff in an easy to understand way. Uh, but also like do more uncomfortable shit. Like I think for me, like the most beneficial thing with my professional and personal life is doing uncomfortable stuff and doing things where I just feel out of place or I feel like the dumbest person in the room. I just don't know what's going on, but I just do it anyways. And it's been one of the most beneficial things I've done in my life. So just constantly pushing that boundary. And like, you do that for six months or 12 months or a year. You look back on your life, you're like, oh, damn, all that stuff really added up. And you're just a completely new person. So, yeah, I uh, I encourage I encourage both those things. Good one. Good one. Uh, people don't want to do the uncomfortable shit. I, I finished uh, T. Carl Wecker, uh, Rich or Poor book. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, he was talking about the experiment performance with the arrow on your throat the, uh, and uh, the way for you to break it was to push yourself into it and people didn't want to do it like that's some crazy shit but yeah. the arrow was breaking if you do it properly the arrow was breaking people still didn't, didn't want to do it like i think that the humbleness that you mentioned in the in the beginning and uh, the um, staying in the comfort zone like not putting yourself uh, to judgment being afraid of it for for your whole life like it's it might be the thing that stops people from uh from going from doing shit the right way 100 percent, 100 percent. it's huge man Oof. we've got a lot of content today we got a lot and um, the last question is where can people find you online you can find me under your bed Haha, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's my stupid joke. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm my main channel is well, YouTube now. Hey, Dakota. Um, and then Twitter at wrongs to write W R I T E, Instagram at yo Dakota. And I'm on LinkedIn and threads as well. And uh, yeah, but Twitter and YouTube are my main ones right now. Cool. All the links will be in the in the descriptions uh, for me. Thank you for coming in. Thank you in the name of on, on behalf of my audience that's slowly growing with the <laughs> GAP framework. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Hope you enjoyed and uh, maybe till next time. Hell yeah! Thank you, brother. I appreciate you having me on. Um, no, yeah, I enjoyed this and yeah, happy to come on again in the future. Thanks, thanks.